Good evening and welcome to Vegan Egg Gardener's Question Time, uh, Harvest Festival edition. My name is Tony Marty. I'm the editor of the Vegan Organic Network magazine, Growing Green International. I run a five acre veganic permaculture small holding in South Wales. Uh, if you want to ask any questions, please add them to the comments section and we'll try and add, answer them at the end. Or if we run out of time, we'll try and include them in the next show. So on tonight's show, we have three guests, Cherry Chung, John Dale and Piers Warren. And we'll start first with Cherry Chung. And we will make you vocal. Hi, Cherry, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good, thanks, how are you? Good, thanks. So uh, a little bit about Cherry. Cherry's been helping out on Von stalls for many, many years. And she also created the eye-catching sign that we use at many of our shows, um, which, I believe we will be able to show, Dan. And sorry about this. Here we go. Oh, there we go. So that's in the background. <laughs> right. So, Cherry, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and show us some of the examples of your work? Um, yes. Um, I've been uh, working with Willow for uh, maybe 25 years now. Um, I started off um, in environmental science and conservation and got into doing um, willow weaving by happy chance, really. Um, so now I make sculpture and basket making and teach and lead projects in schools and do all sorts of stuff with it. But aside from the craft side and all the benefits of um, doing things with your hands and it being therapeutic, you know, good for um, mental health, as lots of people have been finding during lockdown, um, willow is a really good um, um, as, a, as, a, as a habitat. Um, it's a native tree. There are lots of species um, and they have been cultivated for basketry, um, but they they're cut annually and um, provide um, ground cover and cover for small mammals and birds. Um, in the spring, when the catkins come out, they're a great source of pollination, um, uh, pollen for pollinating insects. And um, they're, they're generally, you know, the aphids are on them. And so you have insects which um, might predate on aphids and uh, they support a whole host of um, uh, invertebrates um, and uh, insects. Um, so um, in, uh, I use willow um, to make sculpture and basketry. And so some, and sometimes I use it to make living willow structures. Um, so that's that's great. It's I mean it's used mainly um, uh, in schools maybe and with community groups um, to, as a as a tool, you know, educational tool to make to make shelters and dens and create fun and soft environments in um, school grounds. But people use it in their gardens and allotments for um, you know to make shelter and to in allotments to um, to make windbreaks for plants. So it's really versatile, grows up really quickly. And then you also, because you're harvesting it every year, you're, um, you're getting a, you've got a resource as well, which you can then use to make other things or you can plant back into the ground or burn it. It's good for burning. And some willows grow, are grown every year for biomass. And those varieties maybe grow 12 to 14 foot a year. 
Um, and that's, you know, that's um, as fast as some bamboos. Um, so if you have it on your allotment, you can use it to make fences and you can use it for plant supports. You know, it's a very versatile and um, very, um, willow weaving is very low tech. There's no processing in it. And when I come to recycle willow for making baskets, I just put it in cold water. So no chemicals involved. So I thought I'd, um, um, shall I show some of the pictures of work I've done? Um, that will be great. Okay, right. Um, these are some living willow structures. Um, um, this is in a school, and you can see um, this is in the first year of growth of the willow. Um, in what otherwise is quite a kind of bleak kind of playground, really. Um, this one is a really lovely colour. It's a basket one, but the the catkins are out on it. Um, and you can make all sorts of dens and shelters and it provides colour kind of throughout the year. This one has got colour both on the leaves and on the stems. Um, you can quickly make quite interesting um, shapes, um, fences and um, just change the kind of vibe of a space um, quite easily. And the great thing about the willow is that um, you cut it in the winter and probably lots of people know already um you, it doesn't have to be rooted um you make a hole push it into the ground for well i put it in about 10 12 inches and make sure that the earth is packed around it and um it just starts to grow come the spring so it's pretty amazing um i use willow to make um other kinds of sculpture as well so this is a den in a school oh. <laughs> Uh, all sorts of things. Most of these things are uh, commissions. So they're either structures um, for inside or outside. Um, this one was a reading corner in a school. So you can't really see, but there are some, um, there's a space inside in a stool where um, somebody can sit out and read to the class. And it just kind of creates a soft uh, environment um and as you can see you can make nearly anything from it uh i started off in with basket making and um kind of went um into the sculpture later on and i teach as well so teach this is a beginners this was a group of friends who came and um all together on a course Right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, um, I'll bring it back. Room as well. Yeah. Would um, do a little um, demonstration. Fantastic. Well, I'll put you to your full screen now, Jerry, so if you can see okay. what you're doing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So I use um, I use um, whole willow, um, round willow, and I use the bark. Uh, that's more recent, and I've uh, really enjoyed kind of using different parts of the um, the willow. This um, basket, which is a backpack, is um, a mixture of the two. So it's um, there's a base which and a lid which is um, willow, and then if you can see there are strips of bark which I've used um, to kind of do this random weaving um, on the inside. And um, this one is um, using willow on a ceramic base. Now, this willow has been peeled. And if you're buying willow, then you can choose um, from the from the main suppliers who are in Somerset. You can buy peeled willows and you can buy um, willows with the bark on. Um, peeled willow comes in two colours. So you have um, a white and you have the buff. And the buff one has been boiled so that the um, tannin from the bark um, after five or six hours boiling, stains the inside of the rod and then the bark's peeled off. But one time, it, that would have all been done nearly by hand. They would have, uh, there was a prong which was in a log and um, you would pull the, the, rot, the um, willow through and it would peel all the willow off. Um, 
And in Somerset, the children would have um, a, a, a one or two week break from school and they would uh, have to go and peel the willows. So I've peeled this bark off some willow. Um, this is um, from probably a two, two year rods. And I use that then to do very different kinds of um, work. So quite different. Um, and then oh, one more thing, it's uh, just a small little rabbit. So yeah, there's not really room in here for the uh, big sculptures that um, I make sometimes. Um, shall I show now um, how we, how to uh, do a little demonstration? Okay, so um, this is um, a willow tension tray and um, I'm going to be running um, a two hour online course making these and um, what will happen is um, the course will be on Zoom and um, beforehand I'll be sending out the kits of willow to people so they'll be able to make one on the course and then um, one afterwards but I thought it's something that's quite effective and um, easy to make um, and uh, probably uh, will, I think it will work quite well to do it um, as an online course. So I've started this one off um, using and people will receive two hoops, um, one to complete on the course and then one afterwards and they'll receive a mixture of white willow sticks and um, these buff willow sticks and then I'll, it'll be a mixture of demonstration and um, you know um, there'll be a maximum of six people on the course so I can support support um, people doing the work. It's very easy. I'm just, I'm going to lay in two or three. And you can see that they just build up from side to side and they um, work like that and you can mix up the colours as you please. Um, anyway, yes, that's um, on Eventbrite. So if you want more information or want to book on, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Hang on. Hi, Jerry. Uh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I, 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 for one, didn't think about all the uses you could put the, the tension tray to uh, until he actually told me. I mean, obviously, as a tray, a trivet. What are some of the other uses you can use something like that for? Um, some people use them in the garden as um, bird, a bird table. You can hang them up in a tree, um, you know, to put seed or bread or whatever onto. And they're, they're just quite nice decoratively. So some people will just put them on a wall um, or use them as bread cooling rack. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it. With their nice open structure, it would uh, cool it nicely, wouldn't it? Yeah, that makes, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Just, just don't put it in yeah. the, in the uh, dishwasher. <laughs> So it survives the dishwasher. That, that's quite impressive. You'd think with being wood, it might not survive so well with that sort of harsh treatment, but that's, that's impressive. Yeah. No, no, I said don't put it in the dishwasher. <laughs> oh, don't? I was going to say, wow. It's <laughs> <laughs> so um, do you have a duration of this course? You know, how long is it for? Or you know, the, any other um, details? This, uh, this first one um, is going to be on Saturday the 21st of November and it'll be 11 till 1 p.m. So that'll give plenty of time for people to um, ask questions and for me to kind of help them um, through the okay. internet. Gotcha, yeah. Um, so it's one session uh, during that period. And what's, um, how much does it cost to, to set up for this? Um, it's 30 pounds. So yeah. I'll send out Kit of Willow and that, that will be enough for making uh, two trays. Right, okay. I did wonder about, you know, if a group of friends wanted to do a session, you could obviously do it as, um, cause people aren't really meeting each other at the moment. So it might be a nice way yeah. for a group of friends to get together. Uh, a vegan camp last year, we sat around and um, made baskets together. And uh, oh, right, not for, right. it was very nice, you know, it was very therapeutic, very relaxing, as you say. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. yeah if people good. want to, um, if people want to contact me and arrange for a, a private group, that's fine as well. So, yeah, there's information on my yeah. website and pictures on Instagram. Brilliant, yeah. Okay, uh, last thing is how far in advance do you need to book? Um, 
a week before um, the bookings will close on the 14th because I'll, they'll, I'll need time to send out the kits. Of course, yeah, yeah, it will take a while, won't it? Okay, well, many thanks, Cherry. Um, hope to see you again sometime and thanks for your continuing support uh, of Vaughn. It's much appreciated. Okay, thanks. Take care. Bye. Right, so um, next up we have John Dale. Hi, John, how are you doing? Yes, I'm doing fine, thanks. How are you? I'm good, Tar. Uh, yeah. You good? So, a uh, little bit about you. you. You've recently started a four acre project called Willow Way in Cornwall uh, to help promote veganic growing, good health, and education, I believe. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, it's um, yeah. quite exciting. It's uh, located just outside of Newquay. And um, as you said, yeah, early days, it's only been, I've only uh, had ownership of the last uh, sort of six months so uh, it's really exciting and yeah great promising future really brilliant excellent stuff so um i know that you're not only uh, an avid veganic gardener with over 10 years experience but you're dare i say a wild food foraging expert <laughs> um yeah i've been called an expert but um you're being uh, modest. You? A bit, <laughs> well, I've, I've been foraging pretty much since I was a child. Um, I learned basics uh, when I was a uh, Boy Scout. And um, I've just grown with it and learned over the years. And, um, yeah, it's just an excellent way to when – I, when I went vegan, it, was, it just totally made sense to uh, search out the local wild and organic foods because, um, obviously, food has – changed uh, more in the last 50 years than it has in the last 5,000 um, with things being shipped from all over the world, genetically modified and packaged and all the rest of it. So it made sense for me to uh, go back to what our ancestors used to eat before supermarkets and source uh, the local uh, delicacies really. And each country, uh, it's something that can be taken all over the world because each country and each uh, region has its own uh, food that's uh, seasonal and wild and f organic and free so yeah it's something i'm really passionate about and um, it ranges from uh, sea vegetables uh, wild leaves fruit flowers um, even bark so um, there's there's a lot to learn and um, you never we never stop learning really but it's just it's a wonderful journey and I'd encourage anybody to, uh, to, to start. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I have been teaching people, uh, as well. So it's something that I'll be doing from, uh, Willow way. So we, yeah, we've got plenty of wild food there and in that sort of area and just aim to inspire people to, um, and educate people towards a healthier lifestyle. There's, um, there's so much illness and so much uh, uh, people don't know which way to turn to for well-being. And, um, yeah, I myself have been on a long journey towards well-being and I've reversed lots of illnesses through my lifestyle choices. And, yeah, I feel like I'd like to just inspire people and uh, share the journey so that people don't have to be sick, basically, and people can reverse their own illnesses through diet and lifestyle. So, yeah. It's really exciting. Fantastic. Yeah, it, it is. A, it's amazing what can be achieved with diet. And I do say to people um, sometimes when they're, they're not really taking care of themselves, I say to them, look, I've got some cheap petrol. Don't tell anyone, but it's not very good for your car, but it's cheap. And they go, I'm not going to put that in my car. Why would I put that in my car? You must be mad. And I go, why do you eat that rubbish food? I mean, why would you put that exactly. into your body? So getting exactly. people to actually think about themselves primarily is a big thing. So well done exactly. for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a, you hit the nail on the head there really um yeah people are always out for a bargain um and generally it's because uh, of media and uh, advertising things are you know people are watching the tv or radio or see signs around the shops or things that generally yeah. need to be advertised are generally things to sort of be a question maybe because actually ultimately food should really be free um you know yeah yeah, yeah. So, food yes, and water. It, yeah yeah mm. well I, 
I see you've got a lovely picture of a mushroom there, Forrest. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's um, actually that's quite an interesting photograph. Um, it's actually two parasol mushrooms that uh, shaggy parasols. They grew really close together and um, they just sort of blended into each other. And I just thought from that angle, it forms a nice heart and that's growing in the woodland. And I just thought, yeah, that's uh, with the morning light catching it. It's just a great photograph, a um, bit arty, but obviously um, edible as well. Shaggy parasols, they, they are um, highly nutritious and um, yeah, a free source of food really. I believe you've uh, had quite a few of them appear on your land recently. Yeah, they um, they sort of early autumn, around September, early September. I've got quite a lot coming up. Yeah, as you can see there, and um, yeah, we harvested, and uh, what we didn't harvest, just uh, when it goes a little bit past its best, um, those spores then go back into the ground for next year. So I didn't harvest everything, just harvested enough, and um, gave some away as well. Uh, but they had a nice sort of autumnal. Uh, sort of really, if I could put it this way, from a vegan perspective, quite a meaty uh, kind of dish. So yeah, something different. Fantastic. I'm, I'm a bit of a mushroom connoisseur myself, but um, I should point out to everyone that uh, as a disclaimer, when you do go foraging, be ever so yes. careful. I'm sure you'll reiterate that. that is absolutely, really yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that's something when I, when I teach people, when I, uh, introduce myself like yeah when starting out with foraging if you're not 110 percent sure of what you what it is you're looking at uh, just don't risk it you know you need to be more than sure that what you're looking at is what you think it is and whether it is edible because there are uh, look-alike plants and there's also look-alike mushrooms so the last thing you want to be doing when you think yourself you're doing yourself uh, a favor is poisoning yourself obviously uh, and there have been numerous cases where people have thought that they had found certain things, cooked them up, made a nice stew or a curry, and uh, well, that was the end of them. So it's it's very serious, um, but it's nothing to be paranoid about. It takes time, and it's one bit, one sort of plant at a time, and uh, it, it comes with experience. Yeah, and it is what it's worth journeying into. Yeah, it, it is. Some of the tastes are amazing. Um, I've had chicken of the woods, which is my all-time favourite mushroom. And unless you've had that, you wow, yeah, it's amazing. But even that has some things that look similar, so you have to be a little bit careful. Exactly. And, uh, double check and triple check. So fantastic. Yeah. There's lots and lots of good books out there, um, and there's lots of loads on YouTube, and obviously the internet now. We can just look up and. Uh, and just double and triple check, as you said, to be sure of that. Yeah. And ask somebody who's experienced. It's generally best to learn from someone rather than uh, try and go in too blindly um, gotcha. and just build up your portfolio slowly. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we've got a couple other photographs for you to have a quick chat about. Um, mm -hmm. We're wasting on with time, so I'll just bring them up for you. Thank you. So, yeah, that's. Um, a process of making nettle tea. The top left-hand corner is basically nettles, fresh nettles that I've harvested uh, from the land. Um, also, when it comes to foraging, uh, just a quick tip, you don't want to be foraging um, close to uh, roads or um, sort of main roads especially, or um, anywhere that could have had uh, look like Roundup or any chemicals around it or even petrol. And, um, also out of the dog wee zone, we call it. So yeah, those are things to be uh, aware of. But this was, uh, the further out into nature you go, um, you can just find the vibrant uh, food and it, you can just tell that it's good. So top left is fresh, um, added boiling water to it, which is on the right, uh, soaked it overnight. That's the bottom left um, picture. And then it's just, it, it becomes this uh, right, really dark black drink basically high in minerals and it's just like a total tonic uh, i have it as a really strong tea from time to time and i just find it really really uh, nourishing and that's just uh, the bottom right corner is um 
sort of just showing you how quite how dark it goes. So oh, left overnight is the, is the trick there. So it steeps and it cools right down and then have it as a, co a cool beverage, like a water replacement, like a really nutrient dense water, basically. Yeah. 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 And it, they are very tasty steamed as, as veg. Yeah. Actually, my yeah. Favorite you, green. You can, it's really good. It's really, really high in iron. Um, but you can yeah. also do these uh, kinds of really strong teas with other um, wild greens or even flowers. Uh, yeah, yeah, Brilliant. it doesn't end. It doesn't end at nettles. So <laughs> it starts at um, nettles. It uh, starts at nettles. <laughs> I remember to pick and the young ones if you can. They're the tastiest. Yes, the youngest ones. Um, yeah, before they go purple. That's a, that's another sort of uh, trick or rule. So there we've got a basket of acorns that are harvested, um, obviously tr uh, fallen, uh, ripened on the tree and fallen uh, with wind and just harvested on the ground from under the trees. And uh, <clears throat> then what I did was I soaked them from there uh, for probably overnight or a day or two, basically, and then just kept them moist for a few days, about a week or so. And they all started to uh, shoot little, uh, little roots out of them. And I've now uh, planted 65 so far, but I'll, I've got a load more to go. Um, so I am basically creating a future woodland right there in a basket. <laughs> they can also be uh, uh, soaked and um, create, made into a flower or uh, roasted. So there's a few actual edible uses for, um, for acorns. Not only sure. uh, they're great trees, uh, which will grow for hundreds of years, uh, they yeah. are um, an edible food source um, once the tannins have been uh, soaked out of them. And also our ancestors would have probably been eating them, well, would have definitely been eating them. So, yeah, really interesting. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we've got a couple of quick foraging questions for you, if you're ready. Um, yeah, ready yeah. so this one says, I'm a beginner to foraging, and I'm honestly a little nervous about getting it wrong. Can you suggest some easy ways to get into this from Pete? Okay. Um, that, is, that is, well, wise, actually. You, it, it can be a little nerve-wracking. I mean, I've done it since I was a boy, and... Um, Basically, you want to get yourself on some, get yourself some really good books, uh, reference books, and um, if you can get yourself on a course with somebody, um, yeah, that was that, somebody who's recommended, Robin H Harford. He's one of the leading uh, foraging specialists in the country. Uh, I've yeah. done his foraging mentor course. And um, I'd recommend getting information from him or, gosh, yeah, there's, there's, yep. there's a lot of wild food books out there. Um, okay, that's, that's but lovely. Yeah, start yeah. off slowly. Start off slowly. That's my advice. And, and don't get too nervous about it. Yeah. And if you can, Fantastic. yeah, but you must be 100% sure before you start, before you, before you actually sample something. Sure. Right. Uh, second question. What are the tastiest things you found uh, whilst foraging from Sam in Scotland? Tastiest. Okay. <laughs> well, <clears throat> one of the one of the old favourites, everybody's probably tried them and forgets that it's actually foraging, but blackberries, everybody's at blackberries. And um, obviously we're just coming to the end of the season right at the moment. But yeah, that's a good favourite. And then things like wild fruit. Um, Wild apples um, or wild pears, you can often find them just uh, when you're out walking and they are just so different to what you'll taste um, from supermarket bought. Um, things like sea buckthorn, that's a really, really potent uh, food source, really, really medicinal, really strong. And yeah, it is nothing quite like it. It's absolutely amazing. Um, sea vegetables really high in uh, vitamins and minerals and nutrients and um yeah. yeah if you think to like health food shops or wherever you might be able to buy a lot of these um 
yeah, so seaweeds or herbs or spices, things can be quite expensive. But if you get out into yeah. nature when things are in abundance, um, yeah. they're actually free and you can harvest enough for a year, like in a day. So, Brilliant. yeah, yeah uh, one of the other, uh, I live near the coast and a really good uh, local um, sea vegetable is uh, sea beet and that grows along the coastline. It's It's sort of a predecessor of beetroot and spinach so yeah. <clears throat> that's got a really really nice irony taste and it's lovely with potatoes or in a stir fry or yeah just steamed Brilliant. it's really nice a bit of uh, lemon juice and olive oil on it that's yeah, it's gorgeous it's like Brilliant. nothing you can buy in the supermarkets brilliant thanks john sorry <laughs> you, but um, that's all right yeah time um and uh, and now Add Piers. So, hi, Piers Warren. Uh, many thanks for your patience and uh, thanks very much for joining us this evening. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fine, thanks. And thanks for having me on. Oh, always a pleasure, always a pleasure. So, um, we've got, um, uh, how, how are you doing anyways? Um, I believe you've, um, you've been busy in your garden doing some stuff. I think you've got some produce that you were perhaps going to show us this evening, some pumpkins. Yes, well, um, yeah, perhaps we'll we'll wait and see what the questions are. But um, uh, yeah, of course, it's that time of year when we're doing a lot of harvesting. So a lot of things are coming off the plot and into storage. Um, so here I'm in uh, I'm in the, the western tip of Wales in St Bride's Bay. The ocean is about a hundred meters behind me, and. Nice. Um, uh, so I've got I've got a garden here with half a dozen raised beds, uh, but then I also have an allotment um, over the other side of the, the village. So uh, at the allotment, um, we grow the sort of crops that don't need daily attention, and quite often that you harvest them all in one go. So there we grow the things like uh, potatoes, onions, celeriac leeks um parsnips and then here in the garden we grow the things that need more attention and things that you might want to crop more often so salads courgettes uh cabbages spring onions garlic all that sort of thing so basically following uh, permaculture zoning methods really isn't it yeah um, your crops do later yeah. on uh, we occasionally at a distance and herbs and salads close to the garden so it's very sensible very sensible way of doing things yeah excellent <clears throat> so we have uh we have some questions here and um, the first one is and this is um let's bring back john thank you um i don't know exactly what's happening there so uh what pumpkin varieties what pumpkin varieties will keep the longest and grow well in mid Wales? And also any tips for storage that sometimes might have gone mouldy at the stalk in the past. That's from Bob. So uh, who would like to go for that one first? I'll go first. Go for That's it, okay. So, um, yes, well, my recommendation, which I happen to have right here, um, this is a, a crown prince pumpkin as you can see it's gray skinned but the flesh inside is a lovely deep orange color it's quite dense flesh it's very tasty and um, this is known as a as a pumpkin which will store very well um, it, it has quite a hard tough skin so you you, you won't want to eat the skin um, the key thing with uh, pumpkins are um, to keep them away from frost. So they're often, when you get to about the end of September, early October, that's when the leaves are pretty much died down and they're not doing much to, to add anything to the, to the fruits by then. It's always a good idea as we get into to September um, and even from August, if, if you find a lot of leaves are on top of the fruits and shading them, then just move them aside or, or cut them back so that the fruits are actually sitting in the sun. Then when we get to the end of September, it's it's time to um, cut them away. And the, the, the important thing 
And you can see here on the, the stalk of this is not to cut through the stalk there because otherwise water will get into the top of the stalk and will rot it. So that may well be what's happened to your pumpkins. So always cut at the sort of next joint on from the end of the stalk. So cut it off where, where it was on the, on the vine and just leave these little spurs here. You can see they're just starting to, to die down at the tips there. And um, that will really help um, save your pumpkin from rotting. Um, of course, always check the, the skins for any little wounds or blemishes. And if there, if there is any damage, then just make sure that they're the fruits that you eat first and, and put the sound ones like this one in long term storage. So um, once you cut them, as long as you're not expecting any frosts, keep them out in a sunny position, um, which can be outdoors on a bench or even in a greenhouse. If you've got a greenhouse, keep them out of the rain. And that will help harden the skin. So a good few weeks in sun is really good in October to harden the skins. And then once we get to the end of October and maybe you're expecting some frosts, that's the time to bring them indoors and store them somewhere cool and dry. So it may be a garage or a shed or anywhere, somewhere that's, that's frost free. And you can just sit them on a shelf or you can hang them in netting bags or something like that. But then the finer specimens should last quite a few months like that. So crown prints is my suggestion. Brilliant, Piers. Thank you. I, I've actually learned a lot from that. I mean, I've I've grown that variety. As you say, it, it's very tasty. It's, I've had mine last till May the next year once, which mm. was amazing. How I didn't eat it before then, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> very, very good, good ones. Um, anything you would like to add to that, John? I think no, you're very well covered. Piers just really uh, covered it all there. <laughs> Excellent <laughs> information there. Thanks, Piers. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so we have the next question up, and that is an anonymous question. I only grow flowers and add urine four to six litres a week, diluted one to three with water, to my compost slash leaf heap, as it is a great activator and fertiliser. There are a lot of worms in the compost and there is no smell, but I wonder if this is making it too acidic for them. So anyone like to take that or...? Uh, well, just, just a couple of thoughts. Um, certainly, uh, the bottom line is if it's too acidic in your heap, the worms will go away. So, you know, that, that's the bottom line. But do bear in mind that um, the urine isn't very acidic. So if you think of the pH scale where pH of seven is neutral, any number lower than that is acidic, six, five, four, etc. Higher than that is alkaline. The average pH of urine is actually six. But uh, people who eat uh, meat and dairy products have a higher pH than people who just eat fruit and vegetables. So they may have six or maybe even five. Which, which then becomes pretty unhealthy. In fact, an acidic urine is uh, one of the things that makes you far more liable to get things like kidney stones, for example. A lot of vegans will have a pH actually of around seven, which is neutral. And uh, so of course that's, that's not gonna do your, your worms any harm at all. Good idea to dilute it in wind, uh, with water, as you say. Um, and also bear in mind that females tend to have slightly more acidic urine than males, um, but it's, it's often um, the males who do most of the weeing on compost heaps anyway. So. Very true, very true. <laughs> yeah, uh, anything you'd like to add, John? Uh, no, basically, I th again, Piers, I think you covered most of it. Um, I will just uh, agree though that, uh, yeah, if those, if your earthworms are doing really well, then generally I would say that whatever you're doing seems to be working. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It sounds yeah. like healthy compost to me. Yeah. yeah, excellent stuff. Brilliant. Okay, so we'll just have a look at the next question. Um, so let me bring that up. Yeah. 
So what techniques and food plants would you recommend growing during the very cold and darker UK winter months? Also, do you have an experience growing avocados successfully? And what varieties might you choose? And that's, thank you, Joe. Uh, well, I can say something about avocados to start with because I, I actually have an avocado tree growing outside in my garden here. Um, yep. it's, uh, it's a couple of meters tall and um, I'm not expecting it to get a lot larger because we have the advantage here of living right near the coast in the west which means we hardly ever get a frost which is why the avocado has survived in the first place because they're not frost hardy the disadvantage no. of being by the coast is of course we get high winds and storms and salt spray and that's why i'm not expecting the avocado to get much bigger than it is and i'm, I'm certainly not expecting it to fruit of course, they're generally a warmth loving species from places like South America and Mexico and places like that. Um, nice. So if you do want to grow one um, and bear in mind, they make beautiful house plants. So it's definitely worth a try, even if it's just to have it as a, as a decorative plant. Um, but really, um, you're going to have to grow it ideally in a conservatory or a large heated uh, greenhouse or something like that. Bear in mind, the plants in the wild, they can get up to 20 meters tall. Of course, you, you can prune it, you know, to suit whatever building it's in. Um, and in the wild, they can take up to 10 years to fruit. So you've got to be pretty patient. Uh, but the one I would recommend is a variety called Hass, which is H double A S, Hass. And uh, you can buy these uh, in the UK as, as potted specimens. They may fruit in the right conditions within about four years or so. So um, definitely worth a try. It's an attractive plant in any case. So um, in your travels, Joe, have you ever come across a, a wild avocado tree or heard of one? Yes. Uh, well, I grew up in South Africa. And um, as a boy, we had a great big avocado tree, which was probably not far off of 20 meters tall, probably 15. And um, it had these great big avocados. You don't even get them in this country, probably almost the size of a human head. Um, <laughs> and with the great big flesh around them, they absolutely are delicious. Um, but yeah, I've... I've come across them lots in the wild and I've foraged them lots and it, they're absolutely incredible um highly one of my favorite foods of all times um and I eat them pretty much every day over here obviously not grown in this country at the moment but uh yeah now that I've got a piece of land to experiment with I will definitely be trying to cultivate some over here I have them coming up out of my compost all the time so I yeah. literally, um, my, the seeds just grow themselves. And uh, I've got friends in London who, who have grown, uh, again, from their seeds. And uh, they are little bushes, but they tend to cut them back and let them uh, grow again and, and, and make the roots quite hardy so that when they finally let them go, they will be able to uh, hopefully survive. Um, I've also seen a YouTube footage of uh, a tree somewhere in London, which is absolutely laden in fruit. So they do grow in this country. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to cultivate some here in Cornwall. Nice, nice. Watch this space. I've certainly yeah. <laughs> heard of techniques where you dig a trench, uh, a nice wide trench and cover it to keep the frost off over winter and things like that. So that, that might be something that we could explore sometime. Um, so uh, the other part of the question was, uh, have we got any, because we're running out of time rapidly, uh, have we got any suggestions for um, growing in the darker, colder months? Um, I mean, have you got any thoughts on those? I mean, I generally tend to grow uh, brassicas like uh, Cavallo Nero and um, different types of kale. <clears throat> um, and what else purple sprouting broccoli things like that 
I, I just find they're, they're really good because you can keep harvesting them and they just keep growing right through. I've also got this, I think it's Aztec kale. It's this massive kale, perennial mm -hmm. kale. And um, it just seems to, well, the stems on them are like that. And they just have these great big leaves that you can cut off and, uh, and cook, add to stir fries or, or what it, or steam or however you like your veg. And yeah, I find those really, really good in the winter. Uh, right. Piers, do you have any couple quick recommendations? Um, yes, don't forget you can grow some salad crops throughout the winter. So there are a number of lettuce varieties. Uh, winter Gem is a really good one and Arctic King. Um, you could even grow some of these out outdoors, but obviously if, if you've got a greenhouse, all the better. And some of the uh, oriental vegetables, uh, leaf vegetables as well, like uh, like Mizuma, for example, um, they're often grown at this time of year. Mm. Um, and of course, if, if you've if you've sown things earlier in the season, that, as John said, there are many things that will will will, you know, grow very slowly, but still grow and, and be around for cropping like like turnips and carrots and all those sorts of things as well. So, yes, there's no need to stop growing altogether in the winter. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah. Right. Um, well, thank you both uh, very much. Um, so that's about all we have time for this evening. Um, if there have been any questions, unfortunately, we haven't managed to get to them from the comment section. So we'll try and include those for the next show. Um, so our next show, that's Wednesday, the 4th of November. Uh, if you've got any questions for that, uh, please email us at events at veganorganic.net. And also have a look on our website uh, at the end of this video. Um, so details how to enter our competitions. Uh, we've got one at the moment, which is for three different books, including a cop of the, copy of the Vegan Cook and Gardener. Yay, thank you, Piers. Um, so please do share, like, and subscribe to our media channels on Facebook, YouTube, etc. Uh, and even better, if you can, join us for as little as uh, £13 a year by going to veganorganic.net and click on join. So many thanks to our guests, Piers, John and Cherry. Uh, we we'll hope to see you again sometime. Thanks. Uh, one last thing. Can I just interrupt uh, before, you, before we log out? Um, if anybody would like to get involved or uh, have further, further contact about what we've got going on here in Cornwall, then feel free to uh, get in touch through Vegan Organic Network or to contact me directly. And... Um, We'll see how we can, how you guys can get involved. That'd be great. Always accepting people. Brilliant. Thank you. Look to see you. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> <Hi>, Dan. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>